It's the solstice. It's bright enough outside that the woodpeckers are still squawking. This is the day of the year, or one of the two days of the year when the sun stands still. So try to get your mind still as well. Try to bring things into balance inside. Look at your mind, look at your body. Look at your posture. Make sure your spine is straight and balanced, not leading to the right, left, forward, or back. And then make sure your mind is not leaning. The Taya Johns use this image a lot. Leaning forward, of course, means leaning into thoughts of the future. Leading, leaning back means leaning to thoughts of the past. Left and right are to things that you like and don't like. Just try to be aware. But the awareness itself is not enough. It's the beginning. You want to be able to watch your mind thoroughly. You give it a task. Remember that basic principle. You commit and then you reflect. This is basically the method of the drama. Just as science has a method, the drama has a method too. In the case of science, the scientific method is what ties everything together. The knowledge that we gain from that method tends to vary over time. People think they've proven something and then another generation comes along and says, no, it's not quite right. Things have to be adjusted or they have to be thrown out entirely. So the content changes. But the method stays the same. It's simply a matter of learning how to apply it better and better, with more and more finesse, with more and more imagination. One of the ironies of science is that many scientists believe in strict determinism. But if you really believed in strict determinism, there would be no way to conduct the scientific method. You couldn't criticize someone for having designed a poor experiment because he was, or she was determined to design it that way. And the designing of the experiment wouldn't have anything to do with how things came out. So one of the assumptions of the scientific method is that people have choices, they can make choices, and the things you do will have different impact on the world around you. Now in doing that you will learn things about the causal relationships and things. But the really important thing is the method. It's the same with a practice. We can learn a lot of Dharma. We think we have lots of understanding about what the Four Noble Truths mean, all the different wings to awakening. We may have the concepts down, but we don't really know them until you've applied the method. In other words, you try something out. Before you act, you ask yourself, what do you expect to be the result? And if you expect any harm, you don't do it. While you're doing it, you look to see if any harm is coming out. And if there is, you stop. If there's not, you can continue. When you're done, you reflect on the long term. When you acted on that particular assumption, what were the results that came? If they were not good, what are you going to do to change? You've got to go back and look at those assumptions. This is how we take our book knowledge of the Dharma and the knowledge that we've thought gained from thinking things through. We actually learn it in a new way through trying to develop good qualities in the mind. So wherever you go, remember, apply the method. There may be points of Dharma that you're 100 percent sure you understand, but you really got to test them. 
as you put them into practice. The Four St. Johns, again, make a, a lot of this. They say it's like learning military science. You can draw diagrams on the blackboard, analyze old battles, see what lessons you can learn. But then you have to go into battle yourself, and you find it's a very different experience. And you've got to learn how to think on your feet, test things, and if they don't work out, you've got to use your imagination, use your ingenuity to come up with a new approach. And that's when the Dharma becomes yours. And you know it's Dharma because it gives good results. This is why the teaching on karma is such a basic part of the teaching, i.e., your actions are going to give results based on your intentions, but also on principles of cause and effect. And they follow a pattern, enough of a pattern, so you can learn from them. But you have to do things again and again and again, so that the pattern becomes clear. This is why we meditate again and again, because the mind is pretty complex. Sometimes a method that works today is not going to work tomorrow. And if it, the fact that it doesn't work tomorrow doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad or that you weren't observant today. Simply that the conditions tomorrow are different. Your mind is in different shape. Your body is in different shape. So we have to test things again in lots of different situations. The Buddha gives some standards for judging how well the, the test goes. And again, you're going to learn these standards first by hearing about them, and then you're going to really come to appreciate them as you try to apply them. It's in that list that he used to teach his stepmother. The two main standards have to do with the goal of the practice. We're trying to practice for dispassion, and we're trying to practice for being unfettered. Because being unfettered means that the mind is released. And it's interesting those two go together. You gain freedom through dispassion. That's looking for freedom in a place where we ordinarily might not think of looking. But you think of the Buddha's prescription for how you bring about dispassion and free the mind. You look at things as they arise, see what their origination is. You look at them as they pass away. You got to see what their allure is, what their drawbacks are. And when you can compare the allure and the drawbacks to the point where you can see that the allure is false, or it's certainly not worth all the drawbacks, then you can let go. And basically you grow up. The word dispassion doesn't sound all that good. It sounds like you're dead. But that's not what the Buddha means. It's basically maturing. It's like seeing a game that you used to play, and it long, no longer holds any fascination. It's like tic-tac-toe. As a child, when you haven't figured out what the best moves are, you, keep playing, you can keep playing it again and again and again. But when you begin to see there's a pattern, you start with certain X's or, or zeros in certain boxes, and you're sure to lose. When you see the patterns clearly, the, you lose your fascination with the game. There's no need to play it anymore. That's dispassion. You basically see that the mind has been playing a game with itself, with going for the allure. But when you see that the drawbacks way outweigh the allure, you ask yourself, why continue playing that game? You outgrow it. So those are the standards we measure in terms of the goal or what we want to accomplish as we test the Dharma. And then we look at how our practice has an impact on others. The Buddha says you want to be modest. You don't want to show off whatever attainments you have. You don't go around bragging about your concentration. There's a nice story in the canon of a novice. He's Anuruta's novice. Anuruta, you may remember, was the monk with the, the divine eye. He 
more than anyone else. He could see devas, he could see what was going on on all the different levels of the universe. And he was the one who, on the night of the Buddha's passing away, was able to keep track of where the Buddha's mind was in the different levels of concentration before he entered total nibbana. Even Anuruddha had a novice who could levitate up to the Himalayas, wash Anuruddha's bowl in the pure waters of a lake up there, and then levitate back. And his main thought was how to do this without anybody seeing him. That's the kind of attitude you want to have about your practice. You're not showing off. You also want to practice in such a way that you don't get entangled with others. You're looking for seclusion. Physical seclusion first, so that you can gain seclusion in your mind. And you try to be unburdensome. You don't make big demands that this has to be that way, that has to be this way. In any way that would place an undue burden on others. So as you're practicing, have you noticed that the way you practice is getting you entangled or getting you burdensome? You've got to change. You realize, okay, what you thought was the Dharma is not the Dharma. Or your interpretation of it was not was not right. You've got to go back and look at that again. Then there are the qualities that you develop inside. Contentment, persistence. Contentment, persistence, and what the Buddha calls shedding. Shedding refers to shedding pride, shedding thoughts of wanting to get revenge. There's another great story in the canon of a young prince whose parents have been killed by this king. And he decides he wants to get revenge. So he applies for the job in the elephant stables of the king's palace. And in the evening he will play the flute to soothe the, soothe the elephants. Well, the sound of the flute music goes from the elephant stables into the king's quarters. He likes the sound. So as the young man brought in to play for him, that soothes him. So he tells the young man to stay as part of his own private retinue. And so the young prince works to be trusted by the king, and finally gets the king in a position where he could, if he wanted to, he could kill him. But he decides not to, because his father, before he died, said, don't look too far, don't look too close. Animosity is not ended by animosity, it's ended by non-animosity. In other words, the father is basically saying, don't try to get revenge. And he finally understood what his father's words meant. The Buddha told this story. Apparently it's one of his previous lifetimes. He was the young prince. He told it to the monks who were involved in a controversy over minor, minor things. And he said, look, here are the noble warriors who live by the sword. They can still have forgiveness. They can still shed their thoughts of revenge. Why can't you, as practitioners? Revenge may be too strong a word for the feelings you may have about others, but sometimes just wanting to get back at somebody. Or a conviction that you're right about something, but your rightness is creating a lot of trouble. There are ways of being, being right but being wrong at the same time. So you want to learn how to shed those. Then the pair of contentment and persistence. You're content with material things. If the food, clothing, shelter, medicine you have is enough to keep you alive, keep you practicing, okay, then it's enough. You're not content when unskillful attitudes come in and take over your mind. You don't just leave them there, saying, well, that's just the way it is. I've got to learn how to accept. I shouldn't try to figure things out. I shouldn't try to pass judgment on these things. I just learn how to accept them. That's stupidity. Because these things that come rising up in the mind, they influence your actions. And if you have any sense of compunction, 
he realizes the Buddha says you've got to wipe them out of existence. Remember his statement that one of the secrets to his awakening was that he did not rest content, even with skillful qualities. In other words, if they weren't skillful enough to take him all the way. He kept on looking for what was skillful. When he described his path of practice, it was always that, in search of what was skillful. He left home in search of what was skillful. After he studied with the two of John's, and was disappointed in their teachings, he went out alone in search of what was skillful. But his austerities didn't work. He went in search of what was skillful. When he finally got the mind in right concentration, when he didn't know what was his skillful use of this concentration, he used it to gain the three knowledges. And in each case, he tried to ask himself, once he had gained that knowledge, what was the skillful use of that knowledge? Because in terms of the first two knowledges, there were people who had attained those before him. There were people who had seen their previous lifetimes and then set themselves up as teachers. But they were to realize that's not the skillful use of that knowledge. It has to be pursued further, seeing that the way you were reborn, where he had been reborn, went up and down, up and down, up and down. The question is why? How? And then vision of all the beings in the cosmos dying and being reborn in light with their actions. And again, there were people who had, had similar knowledge, set themselves up as teachers. But the Buddha realized, okay, that's not the skillful use of that knowledge. The skillful knowledge is to figure out how do you end the suffering that comes from this endless round. And he focused in on his own intentions, he focused in on his own views, and there in the present moment, he was finally able to gain awakening. So he didn't rest content. He kept searching. Given that I have this, what's the skillful use of it? And if somebody was not skillful, how do you abandon it? If your practice is that kind of practice, then it's practice going in the right direction. You're following the right method. Because how do you know what's skillful and what's not skillful? Well, you look at the results. You put this principle into action, and what happens? You put that principle into action, what happens? Are the results satisfactory? And it was his unwillingness to be satisfied easily. That's how he became the Buddha. So these are the principles, the ways of measuring your actions. Are they really skillful or are they not? Are they dharma or are they not? When you keep these principles in mind, then wherever you go, You've got the method to test things. It's interesting that the Buddha taught these principles to his stepmother. Because as we see in the canon, there are very few times when the Buddha himself went to teach the nuns. Occasionally, the nun, I don't think he went to teach them at all. Occasionally his stepmother would come with a question. But otherwise he would have the monks go teach the nuns on a regular basis. So when his stepmother came and asked for a short teaching that would help her in her practice, he gave her the principles so that she could learn how to depend on herself to test what is and is not the Dharma. So this is the method. This is how the Dharma gets tested. And this is what guarantees the Dharma. Because as I said, you can read the books. You can think things through, and it can all make sense. But if you don't actually put things into practice, you don't really know. And if you don't put them into practice, you don't understand the subtleties of some of the concepts. We had an old man come and stay with us at the monastery for several years, and by the time I said it, when he was younger, he had ordained as a monk studied and passed the seventh grade of the Pali exams, which was way up there. And then disrobed, got a job with the government, 
And then when he retired, he came out to live at the monastery. He was con constantly contemplating the meaning of different Pali phrases. He still kept his interest in Pali going. But John Fu made an interesting comment one time. He said this, the guy's understanding of the Dharma was really coarse. He was someone who passed all those exams, had lots of knowledge about the language. But that was it. It was in words. If you want subtle knowledge of the Dharma, you've got to practice. And you've got to be very observant and use your ingenuity. You've got to use your ingenuity when there are things that you think you understand, but when you put them into practice they don't work. You've got to figure out why. So you're not just here obeying instructions. You've got to put some of yourself into this. Just like, doc <clears throat> just like scientists, they have to put some of themselves into designing their experiments right, using their ingenuity to figure out how they're going to detect a certain relationship. The more you put into it, the more you're going to get out. <clears throat> 